The psalmist writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Well, we're going to begin this morning by singing a hymn that you'll find in our blue hymn books, number 196, which is indeed based upon two Psalms, Psalm 103 and Psalm 150. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, O oh, my soul, praise him, for he is your health and salvation. Come all who hear, brothers and sisters, draw near. Praise him in glad adoration.
Let us pray together. We do indeed gladly praise and adore you, dear Father. We bring our praise to you, the Lord, the covenant maker, the covenant keeper, the almighty one, the king over all the creation that you have made. After your own image, you have fashioned us. But we praise you not only for being our creator, but also for being our great redeemer. And then through your son, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have reached down to us and cleansed us from all of our sin by his very blood. And even now through Holy Spirit, you are remaking us. We praise you for this health, this spiritual health, and our salvation that is eternal. We come to you at the beginning of this year of grace, 2018, bringing our praise to you as the one who is above all powers and dominions, and who indeed is above all things so mightily reigning. We begin this year knowing that this year will open up unnumberable opportunities to us, but we also know that there will be just as many obstacles that we will have to face this year. And so we are comforted and filled with confidence in the knowledge that you are keeping us safe at your side and will indeed every day this year gently sustain us and sustain us especially as we go about your business, the business of bringing the good news concerning your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to our world that is lost in darkness and sin without you. We know for sure that you will indeed prosper our work and defend us. And even as your people, we will need your goodness and mercy to, to daily attend us as we continue to battle the darkness and the sin that no longer reigns, but still remains in our hearts. And so, almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to thee, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly thine, utterly dedicated unto thee, and then use us, we pray, as thou will, and always to thy glory and the welfare of thy dear people, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, a very happy new year to, to you all. Welcome to our morning service here at the Tron Church. A particular welcome if you are visiting with us or joining us for the first time today. Please do make yourself um, known to us. We would love to welcome you and to, to get to know you and to let you know um, all that happens um, in the church. We would indeed welcome you all back this evening for our service at 6.30. Um, our preacher will be Philip Copeland. Um, if I could just turn your attention to the notice sheets um, that should be with your hymn book on your sheets, I just want to draw your attention to um, a couple of things. A um, few things again starting off. Um, this week, but the things I want to draw your attention to, you will find on the back page. It was so good and so encouraging, wasn't it, to have so many visitors uh, join us during our, our Christmas services. And so quite purposefully, we have a, a Christianity Explode course beginning on Monday the 15th of January, uh, one week uh, tomorrow, um, and it will be held here at Tron uh, Central. It's not too late to, to sign up for that course or indeed ask someone to, to come along to that course. You will find the details there on the sheet. And even if you're not um, bringing anyone along, please do still be praying for those leading and attending Christianity Explode over these um, seven weeks. I don't know about you, but my diary is already uh, filling up. Uh, but a date for your diary and, uh, is there on Tuesday the 16th of January, 7.30, here at the Tron, um, Tron Central. The Christian Institute will be hosting an event entitled Families Under Fire. And this will be a very helpful and an informative night uh, for us as Christian believers. It seems ever increasingly, nearly every week, the state's intrusion um, um, into our, our family life. And so this, this evening is designed to equip Christians with biblical principles and knowledge uh, to be able to respond to these um, issues with, with great confidence. And one last thing there at the bottom, uh, the funeral service for, for Margaret Ross will 
take place this coming Thursday morning uh, at the Lynn Crematorium at 9.30. Please do be praying for Philip Copeland, who will be taking that service. And please, friends, do be in prayer, especially for Margaret's two daughters, uh, Morag and Karen. After the funeral service, there will be a cup of tea served back here uh, at Tron Central. So maybe if you, um, you can't make uh, the funeral service, you may wish to attend the, the tea afterwards in order to pass on your condolences to uh, the family. Well, friends, I'll, I'll leave you to read uh, the rest of these uh, notices um, on your own and to use them to aid your prayers throughout the week. We're going to turn now in our Bibles. Um, um, you will find it in Daniel chapter 6, which you will find in page 743. We had hoped, I'm sorry if you're turning up this morning expecting to hear a sermon for uh, Dr. Richard Pratt. Um, the sad news is that Dr. Richard Pratt wasn't able to make it out of America in time to be with us this morning due to all the cold and adverse weather that the East Coast of America have, have been experience, uh, experiencing. But I'm very glad to say he will be with us um, tomorrow morning um, to take the sessions at the pastor's training course. So maybe be in prayer for Richard. Um, he arrives tomorrow morning at quarter to ten and then will come straight here um, uh, uh, to begin his sessions uh, for lunchtime. So, you don't have Richard Pratt. You're stuck with me. Um, I'm not American. I'm not six foot tall. I don't have a beard. And I am definitely not a Pratt. <laughs> Let us read God's Word together. Daniel chapter 6, reading the full chapter. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three presidents of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find uh, ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors, the governors are all agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction, that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, No, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. 
and a stone was brought and laid in the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him and also before you. O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found in him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this, the reading of his word. We're going to sing again. You will find it in your blue hymn books, number 630. In our singing at church, we, we sing to the Lord and about the Lord, about his character and about his works of, of salvation. But we also sing to each other to encourage one another and to remind one another and indeed ourselves of our great calling. So I thought it was, it was only too right to sing about this great calling at the start of this year. And, and it's contained here in this hymn. We all are one in mission. We all are one in call. Our varied gifts united by Christ the Lord of all. A single great commission compels us from above to plan and work together that all may know Christ's love.
Now, as the musicians play, our offerings for the work of the Lord, both here and abroad, will be uplifted. You may wish to read over again the words of Daniel chapter 6, which we will be studying shortly. You may wish to pray for someone you know who is in need at this time. Or you may like to use the time to pray for Margaret Ross's daughters, Morag and Karen, as they face their mum's funeral this week. Now, as the musicians play, our offerings for the Lord's work will be uplifted. together. Dear Father, we bring these monetary gifts to you as a token of our love for you, for all that you are and for all that you have done for us. We offer these gifts as, as an expression of our desire, our desire that the name and the fame of the Lord Jesus Christ would be spread abroad in this city, in our nation, and indeed all throughout our world through the work of our many mission partners. Dear Father, we know that in order for someone to respond to the gospel, they must first hear the gospel. And so therefore, someone must know the gospel and someone must be willing to share that gospel with them. And so, dear Father, we pray that a, a fitting portion of, of all our monetary gifts would be used in the task of equipping and training future generations of church leaders and, and Bible teachers. We thank you for our partnership with the, the Cornhill training course that is committed and dedicated to this very task. We thank you for those on the, the pastor's training course who will meet this week to be instructed in the things of, of Christian ministry. And we pray that this, this week would be a real blessing to all those in attendance. We give you great thanks for, for Dr. Richard Pratt, the president of Third Millennium Ministries, who will indeed be um, leading those sessions. We pray that you would strengthen Richard, Father. We pray that he would get here safely and that you would give him indeed all that he needs uh, for the week ahead. 
We thank you so much, Father, for the ministry of Third Millennium Ministries and their great call and their great desire that seminary biblical education would be available to the world for free. And so, dear Father, we, we pray to that end that all the financial needs of Third Millennium Ministries would be met in full this year so that the ever-increasing um, uh, desire for good biblical materials and biblical training all over the world might be met. And Father, it also gives us great cause of, of joy and thanks um, this first Sunday of the year. Great joy that a, a new fellowship of believers will be meeting for the first time in our city this very day. We thank you so much, Father, for Hope Church. Hope Church, based there in the East End, in the area of Barlanock, one of the roughest, poorest, and toughest areas in our city. We thank you for that, that congregation that is getting going today. We thank you for um, their leader, Pete Stewart. We thank you for his commitment to those in that area of Berlanock and his gospel witness in that area over, over many years. We thank you for all those who are committed to, uh, to that congregation and who will have moved into the area of Berlanock in order that the gospel witness in that area might indeed be strengthened, making Jesus known. And so, Father, we pray that you would encourage this fledgling congregation at the beginning of this year, and even in the earliest days of their existence, they might know real, tangible, and lasting encouragements. And also to that end, at the beginning of this year, we also ask, dear Father, that you would indeed take our very lives, and you would use us in the sphere of influence in which you have set us, in order that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ might be known by those in our homes, our families, those in our streets, our neighborhoods, in our schools, and in our colleges and universities, in our places of work, and in our times and places of leisure, so that the light and the life of the gospel may dawn in, in people's hearts, dispelling the death and the darkness of sin. And now as we turn to your word, Father, we ask that your voice, O God, would speak to every heart today to encourage or prohibit urging action or delay. Come clear the vagueness which so often impedes us. Come enlighten mind and soul. And through Jesus Christ who leads us, teach us the truth that makes us whole. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, just before we come to God's Word, we will sing again number 525 in the Blue Hymn Books. Wind of God, dynamic spirit, breathe upon our hearts today.
I invite you to take your Bibles and to turn with me again to Daniel chapter 6, which you will find in page 743 of the Pew Bible. And as you turn that page up, just a brief prayer. Father, what we have not, we pray that you would give us. What we know not, we pray that you would teach us. And Father, what we are not, we pray that you would make us for the glory of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I was reminded of the story of, of one of our most famous Olympians, Eric Liddell, who you might remember won the gold, me gold medal in the 400 meters during the Olympic Games in Paris 1924. You may remember that he was supposed to be running in the, the 100 meter sprint. But as the heats were to be running a Christian, uh, sorry, to be running a Sunday, how can you be running a Christian? <laughs> to be running a Sunday, and as Eric Liddle was a Christian, he refused to run. Instead, he was, he was able to run in the, the 400 meters. And even though it wasn't his event, remarkably, he won the gold medal. And he set a new world record um, in the process. Well, the Sunday Post reported on this. And the Sunday Post wrote, It was the last 50 meters that was the making or the breaking of Eric Liddell. It was the last 50 meters that was the making or the breaking of Eric Liddell. And what was true physically for Eric Liddell in that race is also true spiritually for us as we fight the good fight and run the race of faith. And this was especially true for Daniel as we come to, to chapter 6. If we were to play the word association game and say the name Daniel, then I am sure that those who are not familiar with the Bible would say lions or lion's den. The story in chapter 6 is, is one with which we are very familiar, especially amongst the young but the children's Bible storybooks are often misleading as they portray Daniel as a, a young boy or a young man. But the truth of the matter is this, that as we come to chapter 6, Daniel is in his late 70s or maybe in his early 80s. He is definitely in the last 50 meters of the race. And it is here in chapter 6, in the last 50 meters of his life, in his early 80s, that Daniel faces his biggest and hardest battle. Maybe this comes as a shock to us of a younger generation who maybe think that the battle is most fierce during our younger days and we just can't wait until we're 30, 40 or maybe even 50 as it will be a stroll from then on in. There is no doubt the battle is fierce during our younger days. But someone once said this, the devil doesn't care if we start the Christian life well, if we achieve and accomplish great things for God in our early days. But the devil does care if we finish well. If there is one thing that the devil would like to destroy more than our very lives, it is this, our spiritual testimony. And especially the spiritual testimony of those who are in their latter years. For friends, if we fall in our latter years, then the integrity of all the years that have went before will be called into question. Folks will say, it was all just a sham. It was all a lie. Now, you younger folks, I think I could safely say that there are dozens of older folks in this congregation that pray for you every day. But I wonder... Do you younger folks ever get round to praying for the older folks? Do you ever pray that they would continue to live consistent Christian lives and that they would finish the race and, and finish it well? Well, I hope you do. And if you don't, maybe you could begin this year because the older folks need our prayers. And to our older folks, especially those of you who are in the last 50 meters of the race, and I am making sure not to make eye contact with anyone. You need to resist the devil by standing firm in the faith. 
We need you to burn on for the Lord, not to burn out, to finish the race and to finish it well for your good and for the good of all of us who are coming behind you. We need you with God's help and power to model consistent Christian living right to the very end of your lives. Well, let's get into the text of Daniel chapter 6. The first thing I want us to see from this chapter, you will find in verses 1 to 9, the determination of the devil. The determination of the devil. You remember, as, as the book of Daniel opens, Daniel finds himself in a far-off foreign land in exile in Babylon. In chapter 1, we were told that the might of the Babylonian Empire came and laid siege to Jerusalem, the city of God. And the people of God were defeated and carried off into exile under the sovereign hand of God. Daniel and his friends were enlisted into Nebuchadnezzar's training program, which was designed to put God out of their lives. But Daniel and his friends could see that this is what was going on, and they drew the line, purposing in their hearts that they would not defile themselves with food and drink from the king's table as a reminder to them that they did not belong to the king of Babylon, and in order that they would remain faithful to the Lord, that they would faithfully live for him throughout the exile. And under God's sovereign hand, that's exactly what they did. Well, as chapter 5 comes to an end, so too does the Babylonian Empire. Chapter 5, verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. This was just as Daniel had seen in his vision in chapter 2. And so as chapter 6 opens, Daniel is still standing. The Babylonian Empire has fallen, but Daniel, God's man, is still standing. And this is totally symbolic of what God said he would do in chapter 2, verse 44, that the God of heaven would establish a kingdom that would destroy all other kingdoms and this kingdom would stand forever. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my kingdom, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, in this chapter, all hell was about to be set loose in Daniel. The devil is not mentioned in this chapter, but his handiwork is all over this chapter. Our former minister and good friend, Sinclair Ferguson, said this, Sometimes the attacks of the devil are subtle, as in Daniel chapter 1. Sometimes the, the attacks of the devil are brutal, as in Daniel chapter 3. And sometimes the attacks of the devil are both subtle and brutal, as in Daniel chapter 6. Well, as chapter 6 opens, we are told about the structure of Darius's government, 120 satraps or regional governors. And above them were these three presidents or three administrators. And we are told that Daniel was one of these presidents. In chapter 1, Daniel was 14 years old and we saw that he was drawing the line. Well, here in chapter 6, he is in his early 80s. And I suppose we would expect to see him drawing his pension. But no, at the start of this new regime, there is a role, a vital role for Daniel to play. And I hope this is an encouragement to those of you who are retirement age or older, that you never retire in the Lord's service. We are not beginning a, a new regime here today, but we are beginning a new year. And it just may well be that for some of you who are retirement age or older, as we begin this new year, God has a role, a vital role for you to play in the life of the Tron Church, even in this stage of your life. For you have many things that, that younger folks do not have. You have wisdom. You have experience. And a great commodity that lots of younger folks do not have. Time. Time to be used for God. I hope that's an encouragement to you. Well, we are told about the structure of Darius's government. And we are told about why it was set up. So that the king might not suffer loss. So it seems that financial gain and feathering your own nest were as much part of political life then, just as it is today. But we are told that Daniel was distinguished. He was a cut above the rest. And it seems that he was better than everybody else 
at making sure the king's interests were protected. As the king planned to set him above the other presidents and make him number two in the whole kingdom. Friends, Daniel was up for the top job, not because he stood all over other people or because he bribed or bought his way to the top. No, it was because he had an excellent spirit. The king and everybody else knew that Daniel was a man of integrity because Daniel was a man of God. And friends, that's what made verse 4 all so inevitable. The determination of the devil through the scheming and planning of these men to bring Daniel, God's man, down. They look in his public life and his private life and they find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him personally. There were no skeletons in Daniel's cupboard. It's often said that every man or woman has their price, but not Daniel. Daniel couldn't be bought at any price. He wasn't in bed with the Rupert Murdochs of the day. No, he wasn't in bed with anybody. Daniel's beliefs were backed up by Daniel's behavior. He exhibited consistent, faithful living in every area of his life. So consistent was Daniel that these guys knew, verse 5, that the only way they could get him would be in relation to his God. Yes, they knew he was faithful and loyal to King Darius, but they also knew that that was because he was first and foremost faithful and loyal to his God. So they would set a trap, a trap that would make him choose between his God and the king. And they knew that there was only going to be one winner. Daniel would always put God first. I wonder, friends, if folks were out to get us, to get you and to get me, how would they get at us? Is the only way we could be got at, the only way that Daniel could be got at, that in a situation where push came to shove, we would put God first? If you live your life in a way that puts God first, then there is no doubt you will affect the world for good. But it is also true, you will also make enemies. The world does not like to play second fiddle to anyone, and especially not to God. And friends, if you put God and his word and his ways first, people will rise as enemies against you. And some of these enemies will rise from some of the most unexpected places. Well, the plan was hatched, and all that was needed for it to be completed was Darius the king to agree to be made God for 30 days. You see, friends, these guys knew that Daniel's strength was that Daniel was a man of integrity who was totally devoted to his God. But they also knew that Darius's weakness was that he was a man who could be manipulated by using flattery. And these men used both of these things to accomplish their evil plan. And you can just imagine the spin that they put on this. O oh, king, in the early days of your reign, this would be great for uniting all the people, peoples of your empire and would also be great for focusing the people's affection and submission to you and to you alone, O king. But friends, these words echo from the early chapters of Genesis, spoken to Adam and Eve, and you will be like God, revealing the identity of the one who stands behind these men. And notice too the dishonesty that is employed. The devil just can't help himself. He's the father of all lies and has been a liar from the very beginning. All the presidents, satraps, prefects, counselors, and governors are agreed. We are all agreed. It was almost true. And if Darius hadn't been too drunk on the idea of him being made God, he would have smelt a rat. He didn't think to ask, where's Daniel? What does Daniel think about all this? What does Daniel, the fella I'm planning and setting over the whole kingdom, think about all of this? The one man he could have trusted wasn't there, and he wasn't consulted. And the determination of the devil causes King Darius to sign the document and the injunction. Well, what would Daniel do? Well, this brings us secondly to verses 10 to 15. The discipline of Daniel 
the discipline of Daniel. It is here in these verses that Daniel faces his, his greatest trial. These verses were the real lion's den for Daniel. The temptation for him to, to, would have been overwhelming for him to give up praying. You can just imagine the, the voices in his, his, his head day after day telling him, Daniel, you've lived faithfully all these years. You have prayed faithfully three times a day all these years. I'm sure the Lord wouldn't mind if you didn't pray for 30 days. I mean, it's not as if you're being asked to bow down and worship an image of gold like your pals were back in chapter 3. No, you just have to give up praying. And only for 30 days. And those voices can be heard in our heads too, can't they, friends? Maybe saying to us, you've attended the prayer meeting for years. You don't need to go anymore. Let the younger folks start going to the prayer meeting. I mean, I've done my bit. I mean, they've got a good number of folks that go to the prayer meeting anyway, so they wouldn't miss me. It is true. It would be great to see more of our younger folk committed to coming to the prayer meeting, though it's, it's also fair and true to say that in recent months there has been a great number of our younger folks at the prayer meeting. And it's also true, we do get a, a good number at our prayer meeting, a good number who consistently come to pray for God's concerns all over the world. But there is also a great number absent. Absent from the most important meeting of the week. Someone once said, you can tell how much the church is loved by attendance at the morning meeting. You can tell how much the preacher is loved by attendance at the evening meeting. And you can tell how much the Lord is loved by attendance at the prayer meeting. Now friends, I'm just putting that out there. All of our lives and circumstances are different. But you must take this and apply this to your own life. There were other temptations too for Daniel. Daniel knew that the exile was nearing its end. If you read the opening verses of chapter 9, well, we are told that in the first year of Darius, Daniel had learned from reading the prophet Jeremiah that the exile would last 70 years. And those 70 years were, were nearly up. Again, the voices in Daniel's head saying, come on, Daniel, how foolish would it be for you to get killed when the exile is nearly over? Don't be a fool, man. Remember, you're up for the top job. Think of all the influence you could have. Think of all the changes you could make. And think of all the good you could do for the kingdom of God. You can't do all of that if you're dead. And nor will you be going back to, to Jerusalem. The only way you'll be, be going back to Jerusalem will be in pieces, in a box. The devil was prowling like a roaring lion, looking to devour him. My friends, I think it's fair and also true to say that the devil didn't want Daniel in the lion's den. No, he didn't want him dead. He wanted Daniel to capitulate and to compromise and to destroy his spiritual testimony. Friends, I've heard it said that the real miracle, the real miracle is not that Daniel got out of the lion's den. The real miracle is that Daniel got into the lion's den in the first place. It's true, friends, isn't it? that amid all this pressure and temptation to capitulate and compromise, Daniel continued to live consistently. Well, what did Daniel do? Well, verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Some people say that this was done in defiance. You say that I can't pray? Well, I'll show you. I'm praying. An act of defiance. I suppose a wee bit like the fella who it seemed was, was never out of our news a few years ago. A fella by the name of Stephen Goff, who's also known as the, the Naked Rambler. He has spent the best part of 10 years in prison due to antisocial behavior. His antisocial behavior? He wouldn't stop walking about the country absolutely naked. His 10 years in prison were spent in solitary confinement, locked up for 23 and a half hours a day, but this didn't deter him from walking about naked. And this is what he said, I am not a naturist. I am protesting at the social conditioning that you have to wear clothes. If there was a law that said you couldn't wear balaclavas, I would wear one every day. Well, I suppose that would keep his head and his ears warm. I don't know about the rest of him. But you see what he's saying? It's an act of defiance. You say I can't do it. Well, I'm going to do it. 
But friends, that wasn't the case with Daniel. It wasn't an act of defiance. It was an act of discipline. Look to the end of verse 10. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. It wasn't an act of defiance. It was an act of discipline. Daniel was consistent. Friends, that's the very reason that these guys knew they could trap him. Daniel went home and done what he had always done. He opened his window towards Jerusalem and he prayed. Still others say opening his, his, his windows towards Jerusalem was Daniel making a show of things. But it wasn't. It was a statement of faith. A statement of total dependence on God and his covenant promises. Daniel probably had the words spoken by Solomon at the dedication of the temple ringing in his mind. The words from 1 Kings chapter 8. That even if the people of God have been carried off as captives into a far off land. That even there if they turned their hearts towards Jerusalem in repentance. Then God in heaven would hear their prayer and maintain their cause. Friends, that's exactly what Daniel was praying. Read Daniel chapter 9 when you go home. Daniel was reminding himself that there is a higher throne than all this world has known. And he was trusting himself to God. That's what real faith is. It's a real relationship with God that shows itself in real trust in the real things and the real battles of life. Daniel knew well in his heart and his life the words that we, we have in our, from one of the hymns in our hymn book. For you we live and for you we may die. Through us may Jesus be seen. For you alone we will offer our lives. In this dark world our light will shine. You see, friends, Daniel knew that duties are our responsibility. For you we live. And Daniel knew that events and consequences are God's responsibility. And for you, we may die. Even if it cost him his life, Daniel wasn't going to give up on God or turn from him. And remember, friends, Daniel didn't just become like this overnight. No, he was a soldier of God in training for years. Remember chapter 1, verse 8? He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. And all these years later, the resolve, the resolve remained the same. I say this to the younger generation. God may have great things for you to do when you're 30, 40, or maybe even 50. But God needs you now. He needs you now to start resolving in your heart that you will not defile yourself. He needs you now to start living a consistent, disciplined life. And friends, this charge comes to all of us. We are ever more increasingly in the West living in days that are something akin to Daniel chapter 6 where public opinion has resulted in laws being passed, laws that are against the laws and the word of God in the areas of morality, ethical issues, the assault in marriage, and now the assault on our children and what it means to be human. These laws and voices are shouting at us, we don't care what your God says. Public opinion in our laws says this, so you lot better just fall into line. It may not be the lion's den yet in this country. No, not yet. But the serious threat of losing your job or being thrown into prison are very, very real indeed. Well, friends, what are we to do when we are faced with situations like this? Well, we are to be like Daniel. We are to be disciplined and live our lives consistently by God's word. We are to keep on doing what we are doing. Not for 30 days, not for 30 minutes would Daniel give up praying. And neither should we. Duties are our responsibility. And events and consequences are God's. For you we live and for you we may die. Through us may Jesus be seen. For you alone we will offer our lives. In this dark world our light will shine. Against the power and the scheming and the determination of the devil, Daniel lived a consistent, disciplined life. And friends, we must do the same. And that brings us thirdly and finally to verses 16 to 18. Delivered from death. Delivered from death. 
I'm sure we all know how the story ends. Daniel is dumped into the lion's den after King, Dari King Darius has tried frantically to free him. I always find it ironic that the one who was to be prayed to for 30 days as God is totally impotent to do anything for Daniel. Daniel is dumped and the king says to him, verse 16, May your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid in the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet of his lords that nothing could be changed concerning Daniel. The king then spends a sleepless night of anguish in the palace while it seems there has been a night of calm in the den. And it seems that no one eats that night either. The king doesn't eat and the lions don't eat. Early the next morning, the king goes down to the den and, and cries to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. In other words, Daniel was fine. There was not a mark on him because he was innocent. Then the king was exceedingly glad, verse 23, and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So that Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found in him because he had trusted in his God. Daniel is delivered from death. Daniel is delivered. But the king orders that those men who had maliciously accused Daniel and their families were to be thrown into the lion's den and they were killed. Then King Darius makes a decree and sends it all round the empire that the peoples are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel because he is, verse 26, the God who lives. Because he is, verse 26a, the God who reigns. And because he is, verse 27, he is the God who rescues. Friends, this chapter is a great encouragement to us. Well, why, Terry, you might ask, why is this chapter a great encouragement to us? Is it because this chapter says that if we are ever faced with a lion's den in our lives, then we will be delivered? Well, no, it's not. And the chapter doesn't say that, nor promise that. We would only have to read reports from the Barnabas Fund to know that Christians are being killed every day all over the world for their love and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. No, friends, this chapter is a great encouragement to us as it foreshadows the great hope that we have as Christians in the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if you noticed as we read through chapter 6, if you noticed the similarities in this chapter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew writes in his gospel, Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none. Think of Pontius Pilate and how he tried to set Jesus free or wanted to set him free, knowing him to be innocent, but he didn't. A great stone was rolled over the tomb of the Lord Jesus. And think of the woman who went to his tomb early in the morning to anoint his body, and they were met by the angel declaring, he is not here, he is risen. But friends, unlike Daniel, the Lord Jesus Christ was slain. He suffered the just for the unjust, the innocent for the guilty, so that man might be brought back to God. Friends, this is the great hope that this chapter speaks to us of, that we can faithfully live for God all throughout 2018 by standing on the power of Christ alone and standing in his finished work alone. Not that we will be, will be delivered from death in the lion's den, but that ultimately we will be delivered from death as the Lord Jesus Christ has already tasted death on our behalf. Friends, that is the gospel. We will sing in our final hymn, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Friends, that's how all of us can live consistently for him throughout all the new years we shall ever face and right to the very end of our lives. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand in the power and the promises of Christ alone. Dare to have a purpose for him, and dare to make it known. That's what it means to be a Christian. 
as we enter this year of grace, 2018, may God grant us his grace, his power, and his strength to do this. Let us pray together. Our Father, as we begin this new year together, we thank you that our ultimate and last enemy, death, has been defeated by the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ alone. We pray that you would strengthen each of us with this truth, Father, as we go into this new year and into this world with all its laws that are against your, your word and your ways, Father, that you would use these things to strengthen us, to know that we can indeed live consistent lives for you in this land that is not our home. We pray especially for those amongst us who are in the last 50 meters of the race. Please strengthen them, Father, in this the hardest part of the race, that they may finish the race and finish it well by standing in the power and the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. We pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, to close our service this morning, friends, we shall sing the, the hymn in the screen. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit the Comforter be with us all and those whom we love both now and forevermore. Amen.